Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Robin Buxbaum. I'm the Strategic Partnerships Coordinator here at ACHA. This is our fourth ACHA COVID-19 weekly discussion. We've covered several topics applicable to our members, including telehealth and mental health. Recordings of all our Q&A discussions are available on ACHA YouTube channel. For those looking for specific assistance with health promotion, the health promotion section is holding weekly Zoom coffee hours, and those are open to any interested ACHA member. As another reminder, for all the latest updates, continue to check the ACHA COVID website. Um, so since our first Q&A session a month ago, a lot has changed. Um, today, we thought we'd give you an update on COVID-19 and talk about two very new items, COVID-19 and its impact on communities of color and our next big challenge, planning for campus reopening. At any time, feel free to type a question into the questions pane on the right side of your screen. We will have time at the end for Q&A. And one last item, um, those registered will receive a link to a recording of today's presentation. But as I mentioned before, it will also be posted on the ACHA YouTube channel. With that said, let's get going. Before I introduce our four speakers, I'd like to turn the floor over to Katrin Westner Hart, um, ACHA's president for a welcome message. Katrin? Great, thank you, Robin, and good afternoon. And thank you for attending today's Q&A session focused on COVID-19. We have a great set of expert panelists today who will share updates, insights, and examples of work they're doing. I know that it will be informative and timely for us all. I would be remiss if I didn't publicly thank the ACHA COVID-19 Task Force. This group of members has worked tirelessly, tirelessly for all of our benefit. I've had the chance to participate in their calls and the energy, knowledge, and passion they bring to their work is inspiring. Their work and that of the entire ACHA staff have really helped to establish ACHA as a leader in the higher education community when it comes to COVID-19. I have never been prouder to be a part of ACHA. So many of our higher ed associations have reached out to ask us for advice and information. The task force and staff have participated in numerous webinars and phone calls with groups including ACE, NASPA, IACLEA, Residence Life, Greek Life, and Student Union Professionals, the list goes on. We've been able to solidify partnerships and build new ones that will benefit us for years to come, I believe. We know that college health has always been an integral part to the success of our students and our campuses. However, that has never been truer than now. From being the public health expert and participating in emergency response teams and campus task forces, being a resource to campus, answering numerous questions and emails, many of them multiple times, as we know, being a cheerleader, confidant, fact finder, and problem solver, all while providing care, either in person or remotely via telehealth, we are there to help campus any way that we can. Some of us are still in our offices on much quieter campuses than we're used to. Some of us are working from home and learning the highs and lows of teleworking, all while still trying to maintain our own sense of balance and health. It's not easy. The conversation on everyone's mind right now is when we will reopen. This is true for counties, states, and on campus. What will it look like when we reopen? And what will our new normal be? What will we require of people before they can return? For people who like structure and concrete answers, this is a tough one. We're not quite there yet, not quite ready to make final plans, but there are lots of people, including some of us, many of us actually working through those decisions. As ACHA CEO Devin Job and I said earlier this week in our letter to members, looking ahead, we believe College Health will be called upon to lead campuses through this next phase. It's paramount that we're prepared to provide evidence-based advice, develop and maintain close relationships with campus and national, state, and local partners, and remain vigilant for uh, surveillance of infection. As we continue through these turbulent times, please know that you're not alone. You're part of the ACHA community and we'll see this through together. Please lean on that network for support and as a source of information and strategies. Even though we've been planning for a pandemic for years, I don't think this is exactly as we planned, but we should all be so proud of our resilience and grit. What a resourceful lot we have proven ourselves to be. Thank you for the work you do, for being engaged in college health, no matter what discipline, and for working every day to make the world a better and healthier place. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Katrin. Um, I'm pleased to now introduce today's speakers. 
Dr. Michael Huey is the former Assistant Vice President and Executive Director of Emory University Student Health Services. He recently retired from serving as an Associate Professor of Family and Preventive Medicine at the Emory University School of Medicine and is also past president of ACHA, an ACHA fellow, and the 2019 recipient of the ACHA Lifetime Achievement Award. Craig Roberts is an epidemiologist emeritus from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and currently serves on ACHA's COVID-19 task force, the Connected College Health Network Data Project Team, the Foundation's Vaccine Survey Project, and on ACHA's Vaccine Preventable Disease Advisory Committee. Dr. Michael Griffin, currently serves as Director of Health Promotions with the City University of New York at Kingsborough Community College. In this role, he is responsible for managing and supporting several allied health programs, as well as providing support to student health initiatives on campus and within the CUNY system. He is also the co-chair of the HBCU Coalition with ACHA that helps advocate for student health services at historically black colleges and universities. His experience working on community health projects and building capacity around health disparities. And in 2017, he was a research fellow with the Maya Angelou Center for Health Equity at Wake Forest University Medical School. Deborah Beck is the Executive Director of Student Health Services at the University of South Carolina. She's also an adjunct associate professor in the Health Services and Policies, Policy Management Program in the Arnold School of Public Health at University of South Carolina. She has more than 10 years of clinical hospital experience and is serving as the COVID-19 incident commander for her university's emergency response team. She's also a member of ACHA's COVID-19 task force. So first of all, welcome to our speakers and thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to Mike now to update members on ACHA's COVID-19 task force work and where we're headed. Mike. Thank you, Robin. I would also like to take a moment to share the thanks of the ACHA COVID-19 Task Force with, with all of you on this webinar who are doing the work to keep your students and your campus communities healthy in, in body, mind, and in spirit during these very difficult times of the pandemic. And Robin, if we could go back to the previous slide. Or maybe we can't. Yes, we can. There, there's the list of the ACHA COVID-19 task force with the amazing Jean Chin serving as our chair. Uh, you see a list of our team emeritus, which features some of the great ACHA leaders of the past decade plus. And finally, the magnificent ACHA staff who do all of the heavy lifting for the task force. Now, next slide. Well, the board impaneled the task force in mid-February, and uh, it is an understatement to say that the task force has been busy. Uh, it has certainly exceeded all of our wildest expectations. We started out immediately and had eight days to write the ACHA guidelines preparing for COVID-19. And uh, that was a great undertaking and, and gelled us quickly together as a task force. I hope you also have had an opportunity to look at the COVID-19 FAQs on the ACHA website. That is something that is growing on a weekly basis. We have our COVID-19 updates by email every Wednesday uh, with a very high open and click rate. So we know that you're looking at them. We have these Friday webinars. The task force has been working to support many of the areas of ACHA, but also working on webinars and projects with our partner organizations, which includes a, a long list, including CDC and ACE, which is the Organization of Presidents uh, and Vice Presidents, NASPA, uh, so many, many of our partner organizations. Next slide. I wanna just give you a quick coming soon preview of the ACHA COVID-19 survey it is an institutional survey which will attempt to provide snapshots of where we stand at our member institutions as the pandemic progresses. So many of you participated in round one and we thank you for that. Uh, we had a 52% response rate of our institutions, which is extraordinary. And the data from round one is coming very soon. Next slide. 
what's on our to-do list as a COVID-19 task force? Well, we're continuing to work on FAQs in areas that are of importance to you. We are working to provide additional information about interstate licensure issues, which certainly have presented barriers on many of our campuses to telemedicine and telemental health. We're, we will be having future roundtables on topics and bringing in presenters that uh, bring that expertise to the table on our Friday sessions. There is a new resource library of documents, which is policies and procedures and forms which will be on the main ACH a website and open to non-members. So essentially open to the planet uh, because we know how important it is to share this work with all of the campuses uh, across the United States. And finally, we've looked at your questions that you provided in advance. And we know that what you really want us to do is to put together a fall planning toolkit guiding our campuses on what steps to take for the return to activities. And, and notice that the word fall is in parentheses because the key question on this document is not gonna be when, but it will be how do you prepare your campus for return to full activities? And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Craig Roberts. Thank you, Mike. Um, now let's, we'll move on to Craig, who's going to update the group on what experts have learned about COVID-19 since our last discussion in March. All right, thank you, Robin and Mike. Uh, in the few minutes I have allotted to me, I'm gonna just try and cover some basics about what might be new, and especially try to talk a little bit about testing, because I know there's been a lot of questions about testing and serologic testing in particular. So. As of yesterday in the United States, over 650,000 cases now reported with 32,000 deaths. Um, the chart on the right is the daily case count from the John, wonderful Johns Hopkins site that many of you are familiar with. Um, this does appear to show that we are slowing down a little bit in terms of uh, daily cases, but we are still seeing at least 25,000 cases a day nationwide. So we aren't anywhere near the end of this yet. Uh, and it's really hard to predict what that curve is gonna look like from here on out. There could be a very long tail. Uh, I don't think it's gonna drop as fast as it went up. There have definitely been cases in college students reported, especially post spring break, uh, both clusters and students returning from spring break and, and in their uh, cohorts and their friends and so on. So uh, two big things that are very important now that we've learned about it really in the last month have been, concern, uh, been confirmed from the data is that pre-symptomatic transmission is important. Uh, it's really been well documented that people do become infectious, typically 24 to 48 hours before uh, they have an onset of their first symptom. And the second thing is that asymptomatic shedding has also been documented. And depending on the study, really anywhere from five to 23% of people actually remain asymptomatic and never develop symptoms. And that was determined primarily by doing serial testing in that population. So there really remain these three big epi questions. We don't really know how many cases are out there. We have been primarily in, in this country in particular, testing people who are seriously ill. And there's been very little testing in a, in a relative sense of people who are uh, have mild illness or moderate illness. So the true incidence of this disease is unknown. And because of that, we also don't really understand the true incidence fatality rate. Is it high? In the United States right now, it's actually about 5% of cases reported are fatalities, but what's the real incidence fatality rate using that larger denominator? We don't know that yet. And those two questions also will help us inform eventually what is the proportion of our population that's actually been infected? And we really won't know that until large scale serial surveys uh, are completed. Next slide, please. So a couple things about transmission. We now um, know we clearly, this is a very transmissible disease, very infectious. Um, in several studies, the r naught or the reproductive rate uh, number is uh, basically double what it is for influenza. That varies depending on the study and how you look at it. Uh, but that helps explain that basically for every new case of COVID-19 that we detect, that person has gone on to infect at least two other people. And that's why the numbers have been rising essentially exponentially. We don't really understand what the minimum infectious dose is. Uh, it probably is quite low. 
And then, as I mentioned earlier, pre-symptomatic persons now are thought to be a, a major contributor to transmission because up until now, we have really not focused on that that group in terms of preventing transmission in people who don't have symptoms. This continues to be documented really, uh, transmission is by respiratory droplets and contact respiratory secretions. Uh, the risk of airborne transmission through aerosols has been debated and discussed a lot, but it probably is a minimal impact on the epidemic, uh, certainly not enough to sustain transmission over time, if it happens at all. Uh, finally, the, the viral RNA has been detected in stool samples, but there is at this point no evidence of actual fecal oral transmission. But we now recognize that and presume that this asymptomatic and presymptomatic problem is a, probably a significant contributor to, our, to the spread of cases everywhere. Finally, I want to just remind you the risk of transmission is a combination of what the dose, their exposure dose to the virus is, times the duration of exposure. So you could have a very small dose exposure, but if you're with somebody like a patient, perhaps for an extended period of time, like an hour, that is a high-risk exposure, and the reverse is also true. Next slide. So testing and diagnosis, again, an area of a lot of questions. So the real standard diagnostic test remains the uh, reverse transcriptase PCR uh, or some other type of molecular test. So that is the test that's being done by large labs, primarily public health labs, and reference labs like LabCorp and Quest. Many other tests are now coming on the market that are more clinic-based or smaller hospital lab or uh, clinic lab-based uh, that are still molecular, uh, but they can perform on a point-of-care basis. Uh, most of these are the run one at a time, so they don't have a lot of capacity uh, and they tend to also be quite expensive because they are a proprietary platform. You typically have to buy a special machine for many of them and they're still not CLIA waived in many cases. So uh, recognize that as these are coming on board, um, you're probably going to have the opportunity to use them, but we don't really understand yet which are the best tests, and that's still very confusing. There are some 30 or 50 of these actually on the market that have been approved by FDA. Uh, some of them, quite frankly, are not going to be very good, and other ones are going to be very good, and really it's so only over time that we'll actually be able to figure that out. Uh, testing in most places is becoming much more rapidly available, but that really depends on where you are. And sometimes the problem is there's a test kit, but there are no reagents or you can't get swabs. Um, the, for example, the Abbott rapid test uh, that the machine is widely distributed in many places, but they only provided cartridges, the unique cartridges needed to test people for uh, 50 patients. And so that really didn't go very far. And then uh, clinics were forced sometimes to, to order those and still wait 10 days or two weeks to get the to get those cartridges. So there are a lot of issues in the supply chain uh, at this time, even though capacity technically has increased a lot. Finally, in the last couple of weeks, serologic tests are coming to market, uh, both IgM tests and IgG tests. Um, but I do want to emphasize a couple of cautions with serologic tests. They are not uh, the magic bullet about figuring out if people are infected or immune. Um, and just as with the molecular tests, all of these tests are, are cleared by FDA through a process called emergency use authorization. This, uh, this process lets the, the manufacturer bypass the usual uh, approval of FDA that takes a lot of time and they have to document and their accuracy and sensitivity and specificity and so on. So it's really uh, kind of a no man's land out there right now. Um, my lab con here, contact here at our state uh, health lab says really this is, uh, serologic tests are simply not ready for prime time yet. Um, I think we will get there. Uh, there are certainly gonna be some really good tests out there, there but there are also some really bad tests. So uh, buyer beware, you really have to be cautious. I would not invest a lot of money in the testing product at this time until some of that is worked out. Uh, we actually don't know the presence of antibody if that means somebody is immune, that there's a presumption by many people that that is the case, but we actually don't have a correlative protection yet. And finally, uh, serologic tests are not really suitable for diagnosis in part because they can't reliably pick up infection typically for two to three weeks afterwards. Next slide, please. 
So as we expand testing in the United States, I think we're going to see that we're right on this tipping point right now where this is happening. As capacity becomes available, we are going to move from testing only seriously ill people to testing everyone. Um, our state health department put out a memo yesterday encouraging providers to start testing people with mild symptoms. Uh, and that is partly because that is the next step in really getting past our uh, quarantine issues and stay at home orders um, is wide, widespread testing will become incredibly important. We need to test people rapidly. We need to test everyone who's sick. And then that has to be coupled with uh, really aggressive contract contact tracing, isolation, and quarantine in a way that we've really not done before with most infectious diseases in the United States. This is a whole new uh, project for all of us, and I think it's going to require some really close working relationships with health departments. Um, they will really need to ramp up uh, their ability to do some of this and working with college health services in particular. Unfortunately, even though testing capacity has increased in many places, uh, this is not universally the case across the country or even across uh, you know, from county to county, uh, as an example. So, uh, but eventually that's all going to, I think, be solved and worked out. And hopefully by fall in particular, I'm predicting that we, you should have the ability in most college health centers to easily test people um, and test at high capacity in large numbers and get results quickly. Um, testing individuals without symptoms uh, at this point is still discouraged, um, except for some situations of asymptomatic healthcare workers in particular who have exposure and need to keep working uh, and so on. Uh, testing asymptomatic individuals will be important in terms of public health investigation and surveillance going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, there have been a couple of new changes posted on the CDC site. I just wanted to let, make sure that everybody was aware about uh, two things from this week. One is uh, there is new infection control guidance for healthcare facilities. So this would include clinics, outpatient clinics like student health centers, um, a recommendation that everyone entering the facility should be screened for symptoms and fever, and everyone entering the facility should be wearing a cloth face covering or a mask. Um, and healthcare personnel working in the facility should be wearing a face mask at all times. Um, face masks for healthcare workers are preferred over face coverings. Uh, so a surgical, simple surgical mask is fine. In addition, everyone should be screened for symptoms uh, and segregated off if they're thought to be, that makes them a suspect case. So uh, one important thing, and I had this in the prior slide, Influenza like illness now is really equivalent to COVID because the actual incidence of influenza and positive testing in most places in the United States has plummeted in uh, March. So as of now, influenza is almost non-existent in the United States, almost. Uh, that means anybody with an influenza like illness, fever, cough, um, should be presumed to have COVID until proven otherwise and should be tested. Next slide. So CDC has also modified their guidance for healthcare workers when healthcare workers can return to work and what, what the work restrictions are. And basically they have two charts like this. This is the one for contact with a patient who was wearing a cloth uh, face covering or a face mask when they, you had exposure to them. This has been modified to now start the exposure period beginning 48 hours before symptom onset, again, to recognize that pre-symptomatic transmission issue. Um, if the healthcare provider or personnel was not wearing a face mask, uh, that is considered a, a medium risk exposure and they should be quarantined for 14 days. This is different than the uh, essential worker guidance that came out from CDC last week that relaxed some of that. For healthcare workers, there is still, if they've had a high risk exposure or a medium risk exposure, they should still be excluded from work for 14 days. People who have low risk exposures, which would mean that both parties in this situation, for example, were wearing PPE and a mask, then uh, that is considered low risk. They can still work, but they need to do self-monitoring on a daily basis and typically be checked uh, at the beginning of every shift. And uh, both this chart and the other one are available on, this, on the CDC site reference there. Next slide. And finally, um, you've all heard about this guidance uh, for the general public in terms of face covering, CDC recommends wearing cloth face coverings in public settings um, where social distancing measures are difficult to maintain. So this does not mean that you need to put a face covering on the moment you step outside your home, but you should definitely do it when you're indoors in public spaces like stores and public transit. It does not need to be a mask. 
uh, cloth face covering can include a bandana or something similar. Um, and the whole point is to prevent the wearer from transmitting it to others rather than the other way around. So this is source control. There's been a huge emphasis now on not only protecting people from becoming exposed and infected, but actually to protecting or blocking the transmission from the source in the first place. And this is really the basis behind this. Uh, and finally, again, face coverings in healthcare facilities, face coverings should be worn all the time by all parties in, inside that public space. And I believe that's it for my slides. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, as most of you have probably heard, new data are showing that COVID-19 is hitting communities of color particularly hard. Um, Michael will now help break that data down for us. Micah? Uh, thank you, Robin, so much. And uh, just thank you to ACHA uh, for just having the insight uh, and being proactive with including this in the conversation. Um, as many of you have heard, and as Robin just mentioned, um, as the data has started to come out more uh, on the national level as well as state level, we're really starting to see things that a lot of people in the health equity field um, already have known, um, that African-Americans and individuals uh, from Latino communities are starting to be disproportionately affected uh, by symptoms of COVID-19, whether it's coming down with the virus or actually resulting in death. Um, and as of today, there isn't any national data uh, that disaggregates or break down those deaths or those cases uh, by race. Um, but as if you've been watching the news or if you've seen uh, your local health officials talk, they are looking at um, hopefully over the next uh, week to month um, having national data that's made available that breaks down uh, those statistics by race. Um, so just some of the states uh, that have started to report uh, some of these statistics, which actually raised the alarm, I put the highlight um, on the disparities that exist in these communities have been states like New York, uh, Wisconsin, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, Illinois, um, with the city of Chicago being a, a, a city that's a cluster uh, for some of these racial disparities. But over this past couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of reports, a lot of data that's come out on a state level that's really shown us um, the disparities that are starting to come out, which actually allowed us to really start to break down this data and look at ways that we can not only impact uh, these communities right now, um, but also looking at ways that we can impact health disparities and kind of leverage some of those health inequities that we're talking about uh, moving forward once this epidemic is over. Um, so on this next slide, uh, you'll see here just some of these states uh, statistics that are broken down based off the population with number of deaths. Um, and this is taken directly from the Associated Press. Uh, and as you can see here, African-Americans uh, are accounting for 40% of COVID-19 deaths in the United States, uh, where the race of the victim uh, has, made, has been publicly known. Um, and this data is coming directly from states, cities, uh, and counties uh, show that Black people are regularly over, overly represented uh, compared to the share of the population. Um, so you can see here in this top chart, uh, Mississippi is probably the largest or has the biggest uh, disproportionate uh, rates when it comes to the percentage of population that African Americans represent, where in Mississippi they represent a little bit under 40% of the total population, but account uh, for over 70% of deaths uh, where 67 percent uh, 67 deaths that have occurred uh, in Mississippi, uh, 48 of those have been um, African American, and the list goes on. With Louisiana being separate, with Louisiana being second, um, it's having the biggest disproportion or the biggest inequity of race disparities when it comes to COVID-19 deaths, where African Americans make up a little bit over a little bit over 30 percent of the population, but account for 70 percent of deaths. Um, the list goes on uh, with the District of Columbia. Uh, Michigan, Alabama, uh, Illinois, and North Carolina all uh, reporting large disparities. Um, and then that second chart at the bottom um, actually looks at three different cities um, that have some of the largest disparities where we see New York um, isn't as large as some of the other ones. But as those uh, statistics and that data continues to come out, uh, we do expect those numbers to go up, unfortunately. But Milwaukee, Wisconsin um, is probably one of the largest urban environments that has the biggest disproportionate data that represents and shows how COVID-19 is impacting uh, African-Americans in particular, where a little bit over, a little bit less than 40% um, of the population is African-American, but well over 70% of the deaths um, have been attributed to African-Americans in this population. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, so what causes this? Um, I know we talk about um, some of the risk factors and some of the instances, there's still a lot to be known about COVID-19 and how it impacts people and some of those risk factors that are attributed uh, to these high rates. But we can really look at health disparities 
um, as a root cause for some of these inequities that we're seeing uh, that's starting to come out. Uh, so what are some of those inequities? Um, of course, limited access to health care. Um, we know that African Americans are a population that's still highly uninsured, um, as well as Latinos when it's compared to other racial ethnic groups, where 9.7% um, of African Americans uh, were insured, were just four, I'm sorry, 5.4% of white Americans uh, were insured, whereas 9.7% of African Americans were insured. And then when we look at the actual amount that's spent on health care, uh, the average family spends about 8000 a little bit over $8,000 per year on healthcare premiums, out of pocket, out of pocket costs for things such as office visits, co-pays, prescription drugs, and then those surprise medical bills. Whereas African Americans are spending upwards of 20% of their annual income on healthcare. Um, and then the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Office of Minority Health reported that 58% of African Americans uh, live in the South. Um, and as we know, uh, most of those Southern states were the majority of states that did not expand. Um, access to Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, so when we look at the disparities that exist across the country and those states that are being hit hardest in African American and Latino communities, um, I don't think it's any secret how access to health insurance and health care can be directly contributed to some of these pre-existing conditions. Um, and directly from the Center for Disease Control, they report that people of all ages with underlying medical conditions are at higher risk for severe illness, uh, particularly if the underlying medical conditions are not well controlled. Um, and as we know, or if we look at some of those chronic diseases that make you at higher risk for um, dying from diseases related to COVID-19, is chronic lung disease or moderate to severe asthma, uh, serious heart conditions, uh, conditions that can cause a person to be immunocompromised, uh, such as smoking, uh, immunodeficiency, uh, poorly controlled HIV or AIDS, uh, ex extended or prolonged use of corticosteroids that actually weaken the immune system. Uh, severe obesity, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney, chronic kidney, chronic kidney disease, as well as liver disease. Uh, so when we're looking at all of these pre-existing conditions, um, if anybody's familiar with you know, health statistics and you know health outcomes, we know that individuals from African American communities as well as Latino communities tend to be overly represented as individuals that are living with some of these pre-existing conditions or risk factors that can make them at higher risk. Uh, for dying from COVID-19 or being exposed to COVID-19. Um, also, racism and medical distrust um, is a big factor that can be a root cause for health disparities that we're seeing in these communities. Um, we know that there are several African-Americans uh, communities as well as Latino communities that have higher levels of distrust when it comes to the medical uh, institutions in the United States, and this is historical in nature. Um, also, racism or perceived discrimination that African-Americans feel uh, when they receive care from physicians that aren't uh, from the same racial background as them can also decrease their instances of wanting to seek uh, seek out health care or even preventative measures that can actually lower some of those pre-existing conditions that we talked about. Um, and then the last one that I think a lot of people don't really consider or think about uh, is the economic inequalities that exist in a lot of African-American and Latino communities. Um, segregation also reduces employment opportunities. Um, it can lower income. Uh, the mismatch of workers and jobs. Uh, as we know, most of the individuals that are still having to go to work are essential workers. Uh, these are individuals that are working in uh, public service fields, um, public transportation, hospital, hospitality industries. Uh, and disproportionately, these fields and jobs tend to be overly represented by African-Americans and Latinos who are still having to uh, go out and go to work and um, increase their exposure to uh, COVID-19 and then coming back home and if they're not being tested or not practicing, some of those preventative measures can easily transmit or continue to be asymptomatic and transmit that disease uh, throughout their communities. Uh, so it's really important that uh, when we're talking about uh, reducing the onset of COVID-19 and slowing the spread and flattening the curve that for individuals that are from these communities, such as African-Americans and Latinos and people of color, there are several factors and there are several instances that actually led them to being more at risk uh, before this disease or before this epidemic um, actually onset. Um, so those are some of the background uh, instances that can lead to this. So what are some recommendations or what are some things that we can do uh, to actually improve this disparity, both currently as well as long term? And I'll talk about that on the next slide, uh, briefly kind of highlighting some of those instances. Uh, so you can see here just some recommendations. Uh, these are both immediate as well as long term recommendations to support or lower the uh, 
the onset of COVID-19 for African-American communities as well as, well as Latinx communities. Uh, so we can increase widespread testing in African-American and Latinx communities. Um, on the previous slide, we talked about risk factors or what makes people be at higher risk uh, for contracting this disease. And if we go down the list of pre-existing conditions, and we know the data and research supports that African-Americans and Latinos tend to have higher instances of pre-existing conditions, then we know that asymptomatic individuals can easily transmit uh, this disease unbeknownst to them to other individuals. So we definitely need to increase widespread testing in these communities. Um, I know in the city of New York, um, they have implemented drive-through testing, uh, which is a great measure. Unfortunately, a lot of times this drive-through testing isn't always made widely available for different individuals across different boroughs, which would still require them to use public transportation to gain access uh, to get this testing. Uh, the second one will be, will be to provide PPE to communities of color especially in dense urban centers, um, such, such as masks, uh, gloves, hand sanitizers. Uh, so individuals that live in close uh, concentration or close proximity to other individuals, it's important that when we talk about ways to prevent the spread of COVID-19, that we're ensuring that these individuals that live in these communities that might not have access to be able to purchase some of this protective equipment that our cities and our states are doing a better job of providing uh, the protective measures or the protective resources or equipment to slow down this spread. Um, another immediate as well as long-term recommendation could be to help streamline uh, federal research funding to historically black colleges and minority serving institutions, especially as it relates to research both on COVID-19 um, as well as health equity and health disparities. Um, there are several HBCUs that participate uh, in research funding and research grants from the National Science Foundation um, as well as from the CDC. Um, so really look at ways that we can make the plan feel more equitable and ensure that there's adequate funding going to support these institutions that are doing this groundwork uh, to close some of these gaps in health disparities and health equity. Um, and I'll just kind of move along a little bit quicker since I know we're pressed for time, but some other long-term recommendations will be to explore telehealth options that address primary care utilization. Because um, as you can imagine, especially in large urban areas, when we're talking about managing chronic disease, that requires preventative measures. So even though our hospital systems are overwhelmed, what are we doing as healthcare providers to reach out and support those individuals that are still living with or having to uh, result or take care of diabetes, uh, obesity, chronic disease, uh, kidney disease. Telehealth is an amazing option that can still reach out to these individuals and ensure that they're still receiving the type of care that they need to manage this disease and keep their risk factors low to ensure that they don't come in contact or contract COVID-19. Um, and community health workers are a great resource and a great option to actually go out into these communities that they're familiar with and be able to engage with these individuals and use those telehealth options. Um, and the last one, um, as far as a long-term and an immediate recommendation would be to provide essential workers hazard pay. Um, and this isn't a, a race-related uh, option. I think this is across the board and we can probably, we can probably all agree uh, the important role that our essential workers are playing during this time. Uh, but like I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the essential workforce is overly represented by uh, individuals of color from both communities of color, such as African-Americans and Latinos. Um, and they are essentially um, in hazardous situations. Um, I know there are a lot of instances where they aren't receiving the type of protective equipment that they need. And every day in and day out, they're risking their lives to ensure that our lives go on and there's very little disruption. So ensuring that there is essential um, essential workers receive hazard pay to lower their costs and ensure that during this time that they aren't hit as hard uh, because of the economic um, impact that this virus is having on all of us. Um, so lastly, uh, what can colleges do during this time to support uh, particularly students of color? Um, I know a lot of our colleges, especially our student health centers and our health promotion departments are using virtual interaction, whether it's social media, whether it's via telehealth, um, they're using creative ways and now more than ever, um, us, as, us as college health professionals are having to be creative to find ways to engage our students. So I would just encourage all of you to be mindful um, to ensure that you're providing culturally competent counseling as well as health promotion outreach um, that does address the social determinants of health and acknowledges health disparities in your care. Um, because now more than ever, uh, all students, regardless of race, are dealing with the traumas um, and some of those mental health disparities that come with um, engaging and having to work from home. So just keep that in mind that as you are engaging and using these resources that you are um, using competent, culturally competent resources to engage these students. Also consider um, your peer educators, that they're, those resources are equitable and that you allow students of color uh, to participate in these health promotion and outreach opportunities. So that way 
um, whether you are on an HBCU campus or a campus that's predominantly white or a minority serving institution, that your the faces that are being seen, the marketing the outreach, the students that are engaging across these digital platforms, that they look like the student on the other side of that camera. Um, so please ensure that you're doing that so that our students of color know that they, um, their voices are heard and that their concerns are also uh, being met. Um, lastly, is to ensure that aid is in place for students who qualify for DACA. Uh, that's something that's very big. We have a lot of first generation um, college students that are on campus that are definitely concerned because they might live in households that have parents that are um, undocumented immigrants. So we definitely want to make sure that the financial aid resources are in place to support these students. Um, and the last one is to ensure that we remove some of those institutional barriers for students that are requesting emergency aid. Um, and it's probably a lot of you can attest, um, a lot of our students are in need of emergency aid. <clears throat> and I don't think it's any secret that that could be disproportionate for students that come from disadvantaged backgrounds. So we just wanna make sure that as this funding from the federal government uh, starts to funnel to our colleges and that there are emergency aid packages set up for students that we make this process uh, for students that are requesting this aid um, as seamless as possible. So that, that way our students can continue on with their studies, uh, keeping well-being at the forefront um, and ensure that they're able to continue in their studies with a limited uh, brace as possible. Thank you, Micah. Um, last but not least, uh, Deborah Beck will talk to us about the hottest topic in college health right now, uh, decision-making around reopening campus. Deb? Thank you. Before we even talk about opening or closing, one of the things that's really important is for the institution to look at their goals. Are we looking at conducting an operational plan that is definitely an integral part of your local and state response plans, making sure that we're following the CDC guidelines or who or all the other local communities that support your uh, campus community? We certainly want to stop slow and limit the spread of the virus through containment measures. We want to make sure that we limit that health and social and economic disruption that may occur not only on our campus, but within our surrounding community. We also want to make sure that we're looking at the morbidity and the mortality and the psychological impact that was mentioned before. We know that that's going to be extremely important as we move forward. Another very critical role is how do we sustain the infrastructure and the essential functions of the universities? Many of us know that things will never be the same on higher ed, and it's up to us to plan to make sure that that new normal is something bigger and better than what we're looking at now, if at all possible. So in the next slide, I'm going to go very briefly. Many of us talked about the cruise ship uh, aspect. So I want to talk a little bit about this. Uh, if you're out on campus, you probably also think about the residence halls being a cruise ship. You know, you have a high volume number of people. There's lots of high touch surfaces. People are moving through state to state. They're moving through the country. It's contributing to potential global spread. There's a variety of people that you're coming in contact with and everyone is eating at the same location, they're going to events, they're going to bars and excursions, so it's almost impossible to decontaminate those high-touch surfaces. It's also almost impossible to isolate and quarantine on that ship. Also, when you're thinking about how do we separate the people who are ill from well, it becomes very impossible. And we all know that there's a large number of parties in alcohol. So this, this is an important concept concept when you're thinking about reopening your campus. So how do you control that cruise ship mentality within your residence halls? On the next slide, just to kind of give you a little bit of facts about that, is on February 3rd was the first time that they looked at cases. There were 10 cases diagnosed, and it was actually linked back to one passenger who was from Hong Kong. Initially, for every one person on that ship, 14.8 people were becoming infected. That's huge. By February the 20th, 619 people out of the 3,700 passengers had tested positive and they were eventually six deaths. The replication of the virus was four times higher than the epicenter in Wuhan, which was one to 3.7. So without the evacuation of the ship, it was estimated that probably more than 2,900 of those 3,700 people would have been infected by late February. Also, by looking at some of the studies and formulas about social distancing and isolation and quarantine, it was discovered that if they had evacuated the ship by February the 3rd, it would have reduced that number to 76. And if they had 
evacuate the ship by February the 19th, it would have been uh, down to 246. This is a concept we need to look at when we're thinking about reopening. So as we reopen our residence halls, we have to say, this is a potential, there's a potential for high spread. So we most definitely have to look at isolation and quarantine within those areas in order to open up effectively. We also have to have a means to do contact tracing so that we can reduce this number of individuals. We can't even hardly imagine that one, that R naught of 14.8. On the next slide, it sort of talks about a little bit about other complicating factors that are in your city. So one of the things when University of South Carolina decided to close fairly early, we made the decision was leading the state, it's because South Carolina's ranked 40, 40, excuse me, 41st in the health outcomes and 32nd to access to care. We're in the top 10 of deaths in our state are heart disease, cancer, chronic respiratory diseases and diabetes, and also kidney disease. When we looked at the statistics in China, about 13% of those that had cardiovascular disease and about 9% had diabetes were actually uh, within the mortality rate. Now, we don't have these on our, our campus as much, but our community surrounding, we are a very urban campus, and we knew that bringing all of our students back on campus could really cause havoc in, within our community with our aging and elderly population. Also, we looked at our faculty and staff, knowing that they are also aging so we made that into it as a factor so you have to think about these things as you are reopening your campus and say how do we limit those other complicating factors around our campus so that we don't cause our community to be disrupted as well the other thing we looked at is we actually worked with our school of public health and we said looking at the, the models that we have and the information we have in public health let's look at what would happen if we had eight students who were infectious for four days on our campus environment knowing what the population was. Well, our expert says within one week we would have at least 73 cases and they kind of averaged that out between 52 and 185. They said, well, what if another week we have 100 cases and then we were looking at about 3,000 students being infected on our campus within 12 days and that was just a risk that we couldn't take. The same thing will apply to when we start reopening is it's so important to be able to test our students, look for their immunity, make sure that we don't have that potential outbreak. So we knew within 30 days or less that probably 30% of our campus would have been infected and would be uh, significantly impacted. So on the next slide, when we look at it, I wanted to kind of point out that we collect closed the week of spring break. We were so fortunate when things were really heating up, our students were gone, so we were able to make that decision to say, we're extending spring break and we're not bringing them back. However, we did have one residence halls where we had some students who were predominantly international, but they had not been traveling from an international company at that point in time. They had been on campus, part of our campus community, great uh, group of international students. A Couple of them got on a Greyhound bus, went to Atlanta, flew on an airplane, went to Miami, partied uh, for a week, and came back. So upon arrival, we had our first case one index that was living in within the residence halls. His roommate was infected, and within three days, six ind individuals had turned positive that had direct contact with them. Two of those individuals, as we were getting that contact tracing and getting them into isolation, jumped on an airplane and got into another country. So we had two positive students that actually infected people all the way from the airports into their new countries. The bottom of that looks like we had 53 cases over a period of time, and you kind of see how those cases were, were spiking up. We're very, very fortunate, and currently the slide to the top right shows that all of our students have recovered. This is what you want to see in your community. Now, this is a very small sample of what our campus looks like, but if you kind of look in your community and say, well, we've had that peak. Now we were able to do that social distancing. We released all of our students out of the residence halls. We, we maintained about 100 people within our residence halls, but now we are down to only having three students that are left yet to recover. The other important factor about when we start reopening is we look to see of our positive cases, where are these students and or faculty staff, where do they live, where are they located? So we sort of looked at the hot spots and we know all up the, the Northeast Coast is where most of our students are coming from. We hope that maybe this could be good and it could be bad. It could be good in that a lot of these students may have been in those hot zones 
So they'll bring immunity back to our campus versus bringing the infection back. So those are some of the things that we're kind of looking at as we're making those decisions. The next slide sort of illustrates what we're doing here about how do we reopen? How do we make those decisions? So we established what is called our future planning group. So this was done by our president who has done a remarkable job at leading the campus through this, basically what is a war zone to some degree. So we have seven different teams that are looking at all the different aspects of the university and each one of these teams are overlapping, making those decisions so that one plays into the other. So we look at what is the public health? What are those models look like? What is that prediction of what's gonna happen? How do we set up the alternative healthcare delivery models that are gonna be needing in addition to our traditional ones? How is our admission enrollment gonna look like? Where are students coming from? Do we bring everybody back at once? There's a thought now that perhaps we bring back a percentage of our, our campus population. So instead of bringing everybody at once back, maybe it's a hybrid. So we're kind of looking at that aspect of it. We definitely wanted to maintain our academic and our research. We've done a lot of things to kind of plan. Even though the campus is closed, we are allowing some of that research to continue on our campus that is so critical. And many of that uh, research activities has actually turned into looking at COVID, which has been significant. The financial implication of this is huge. So we have to look about this across all. I don't know how many student health centers out there are either fee for supported or off of tuition, but if you look nationwide, it appears that about 10 to 17% of students may say that they may take a gap year. Now we're hoping that students will get more excited as the time comes by and they'll come back, but we do have to look at there is going to be a significant drop in finances. How are we going to reopen when we have less staff, perhaps less resources? Maybe things are going to be eliminated. So that's really important. The risk management and the public safety, this is where we have to look at what is the risk to the institution as we reopen and having a group to get together to identify what are those risk factors, what are our control groups, and how do we maintain and minimize that risk to the organization? Another one is very important is how we communicate. Our parents, faculty, staff, students in our community have to trust that when we reopen that they feel like they're coming into a safe environment. So the social media, the campaigns, and making sure that you communicate what your plans are, how you're going to do it, and you certainly have town hall meetings and talk to everyone so that they feel comfortable about how you are coming back. The other thing is about athletics. We all know in the, in the South, you know, Football is huge. Well, it could be that football may look differently. It could be that it goes on a little bit later. Could it be less people within the stands? So all of those things have to be looked at. So I would encourage as you're thinking about how do we reopen, is looking at building a structure to where that collaboration, that planning goes across all avenues. And then set a timeline and say, okay, we need to have all this information pulled together so that our president and our senior leadership can make a decision by say May 15th or June 1st. So I think that's a really important things that we have to, to, to look at. So on the next slide, there's a great document that is called National Coronavirus Response, A Roadmap to Reopening. And I have that listed there. There's also a website called covidactnow.org. Those are outstanding resources that kind of help you make that decision. So basically this, this outline says, you know, phase one, we have to make sure that within your community, within your campus, that you have slowed the spread of the disease and you have mitigation strategies. Now these mitigation strategies are to open, but also what happens on your college campus that says, oops, we overshot the runway, now we gotta close again. So you have to do that mitigation strategies in reverse. Phase two, as the states are opening up, looking at, are there possibilities of having curfews within your city? With us being in a major population urban area, we have bars everywhere. We probably have 20,000 students within a five mile radius. Those are huge components into how we open up. Phase three, we have got to continue that ongoing so, uh, physical distancing. And on our campus, we're trying to not say social distancing because what we want to do is to make sure students are socially engaged, but they're physically distanced from one another. So it may be that college campuses are gonna come back and some type of a face shield will be required uh, for each person to be out in public. So there'll be a lot of different things that will need to be decided, but within your work groups, those things can be looked at. 
And then phase four is probably one of the most important is getting ready for the next pandemic. The next pandemic is very, very close. So on the right of that screen, basically this is sort of the criteria that most public health officials are saying is for a campus or a community reopen, there must be a steady decrease in COVID cases and hospitalizations for a two week period of time. The healthcare system has to be ready for that. There has to be sufficient staffing, supplies, PPE, and they have to be able to accommodate the potential increase in cases that a college campus may bring to that community. Also really important is the campus readiness. Do you have housing? Do you have the ability to do isolation and quarantine? What are the environmental activities? As I mentioned before, faculty, staff, and students have to trust us. There has to be a capacity to look at that widespread and do contact investigations. And all of those things may not be present. So what you have to do is you have to look at your financial, economic, and social conditions that may force the reopening, and you have to make the best decisions possible. We all know that this is the, the most complicated public health thing that we've ever dealt with in history. So we're going off of what a friend of mine says, a well intended pseudoscientific long shot. And that's what we're looking at right now. So I think that we all have to look to see, to make the best decisions possible given the information that we have. So at that point, I'll pause to see if there are any questions um, from the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, um, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, as you can, I'm going to open it up now to, to questions. Um, as you can imagine, the majority of them are related to reopening. Um, I was wondering, maybe, um, Deborah, if you could speak to, and maybe Mike also, um, speak to small health centers with limited resources. Um, should they pursue testing capacity? And then also related, should if they if they don't have uh, testing capacity, should they reopen? You know, I could jump in there, and then uh, Mike can certainly come in and, and help out with that. I think for smaller universities that may not have the resources, they have to look to their community first and foremost and see if they can establish a memorandum of understanding or a partnership that may be able to help them within that environment. I don't think that's impossible for them to close without or to reopen without those testings. It's depending on the resources and the community involvement that they have with their campus. So Dr. Huey, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's kind of a yes, but answer, which is if there is any possible way for us to collect specimens for testing in our student health services, that that's an important thing for us to do because what we don't want to do is be moving students from facility to facility, which is increasing opportunities for exposure to others. And also we don't want to be sending our students into emergency settings simply to be tested. So understanding that that would be our goal it's easier said than done. And I know that there are issues relative to staffing and do you have appropriate PPE in place? Um, what kind of tests do, are available? If you're gonna do point of care testing, is it a vetted um, high sensitivity, high specificity test? So there's a lot of things to take into account, but I think doing everything that we can to be able to be a site where test specimens are collected. And then as Deborah said, to have a place where we can connect uh, as quickly as possible to get results of those tests is going to facilitate our ability to start to open up the campuses. Thank you. Um, related, uh, someone was asking about um, doing some screening forms for returning students. Um, does anyone have an, an opinion on that? And, and sort of um, somewhat related um, ideas for, for staggering the return of students? I think one of the processes that we're looking for here, and actually some of our public health officials nationwide are looking at, is if you brought the students back in phases, you know, is it that you bring your health uh, related students back first? Do you bring your graduate students back first? Do you bring 
50% of the campus population that live on campus first. So I really think it would depend on that campus environment whether or not you bring those back in phases. I think it's very important if you have a residence hall and many students that are going to be in those halls having some form of a daily check to see how they're doing their health and well-being would be really important. I know there's a lot of apps that are coming out right now, but having the students actually have to respond and look and test their symptoms, I think would be an excellent idea and it would be one way to help reach and contact or, or to understand who may be infectious very early on. Thank you. Um, this question is probably for Craig. Uh, can you talk about some of the South Korea data that's coming out about uh, possible reinfection? Uh, not, not really. I haven't seen that data. Uh, generally, there's um, most of the studies about uh, concerns about reinfection have generally been when they've been looked at, they've been found that uh, they can't distinguish between persistent infection and reinfection. So it depends on the timing and how people are being tested, but with, particularly with PCR tests, because they are so super sensitive, they will continue to pick up shreds of virus for a while after a person has probably recovered from infection. So that's one big concern. Um, we should remember what the PCR test does not test for whole virus. It tests for small segments of the genome. Um, and so positive result means that DNA was uh, RNA was detected. It does not necessarily mean the person is infectious. So uh, that is being looked at. I know that there was data out of China, same thing, and people, it's been looked at. I have not seen anything yet that suggests that it is a serious concern. Okay, thank you. Um, we're we're going to uh, take a couple more questions. I know we're a little over time. Um, Craig, since I have you on the line still, um, for people who are recovering from COVID-19, can you talk about how long it's expected for them to be immune to this virus? That's an easy answer. We have no idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, I, not seriously. I mean, we don't know if it's going to be three months, uh, 12 months, three years, or a lifetime. That is uh, certainly yet to be determined. I would say th the... And the the, bat, the negative part of that is that it appears that the other coronaviruses that cause the common cold do not appear to have very long lasting immunity. Uh, SARS and MERS do appear to have longer lasting immunity. So it really depends on if this triggers neutralizing antibodies and a good T cell response. Uh, and that it, it, until we have a really good serologic basis to do those studies, uh, we won't know that. Okay. That's one Thank of the you. problems when you have a novel virus is that we don't have a track record. And right. uh, certainly that's frustrating to people because they want to know, are they now, for example, able to go in and uh, work in a healthcare setting because there's someone that has already had COVID-19 and recovered. Just the, the way that in West Africa, many of the individuals who recovered from Ebola went into healthcare settings and healthcare support roles. Uh, we're not there because we don't know uh, whether people will be immune and if so, for how long. Yeah, and I mean, clearly, if, if you've recovered, you have some immunity. That's how you became recovered. Your immune system responded and cleared the infection. Um, but again, it, how long that's gonna last in terms of protecting you against a new exposure completely up in the air at this point. Okay, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time today. Um, thank you so much to all of our presenters for their valuable insight. Uh, ACHA Q&A will be back on May 1st. If you have suggestions for topics, please let us know. Um, also, please continue to share your ideas and questions, solutions in ACHA Connect. And in the meantime, stay safe and be well. Goodbye. Thank you.